And Heavenly Father, with the help of your Holy Spirit, we pray that the light of Jesus would shine in and through the words that we hear during the message and continue to shine in our lives. In his name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Kind of like when the song or the hymn that we sing ties in with the message because today we're, we're talking about light and we're also talking about darkness. I've got these words for you from the book of John, which talks a lot about light and darkness, especially the first three chapters. And John says in chapter 1, verse 5, the very first chapter, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Meaning the light of Jesus. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, did you catch some of the tie-ins, as I mentioned at the beginning of the service, between the reading from Isaiah chapter 9 and Matthew chapter 4? It's okay if you didn't. <laughs> Matthew quotes Isaiah chapter 9, and I always think that's cool. And I, and I love when the Old Testament and the New Testament come together so that the New Testament authors confirm and approve and, and put their stamp of approval, so to speak, on that which was written in the Old Testament. And, and here goes Matthew quoting Isaiah, who wrote about 750 years before he wrote down what he did. And he mentions a couple of tribes, Isaiah does in chapter 9. He mentions the tribe of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali as well. You know, when the Israelites went in and they conquered the promised land, Joshua did his job. He succeeded Moses. And then all the land was divided up into the 12 tribes, you know, the 12 sons of Jacob and a couple of Joseph's sons as well. And it's interesting to know that those two tribes, since they were at northern Israel, not southern Israel, there was a lot of gloom and doom and darkness because the Assyrians would come down. And of course, since they're north of Israel and not south, they would hit the top two tribes, you know, of northern Israel. And they were like a thorn in the flesh and bringing darkness and, and gloom to those two tribes. And it's interesting how Matthew, he's a Jewish guy, primarily writing to Jewish people. He probably quotes the Old Testament. We like to call Isaiah the fifth gospel, remember, or at least all of these scholars and commentary, because he, he's all about the gospel. So parchment's expensive. You know, Matthew's writing, and he's like, I can't quote everything in the Old Testament, so I'm just going to quote a few verses Assuming that the reader, you know, already knows a little bit about the Old Testament and already knows a little bit about Isaiah chapter 9, because Isaiah chapter 9 goes on to say, you know, that for to us a, ch us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders. He didn't quote all that. He's talking about the two tribes that I mentioned earlier. And he says in Matthew chapter 9 that the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And the great light was going to come from Zebulun and Naphtali. Now, it's kind of interesting because Zebulun is the home of Nazareth and Naphtali is the home of Capernaum. Well, why does that make any difference, you guys? Sorry I'm boring you so early in the message. <laughs> That's because uh, Zebulun is the, has the town of Nazareth in it. Okay? That's where Jesus grew up. Now, I just recently returned from Israel. Well, not just recently. It was there back in September. Didn't get to go into Nazareth, but we saw Nazareth from a hillside. Pretty big city. But, you know, back in Jesus' day, we're talking about five to ten acres. I mean, you know how we think of small town America, USA? I mean, we're talking dinky. Reminds me of Worms, Nebraska. Right outside of Grand Island. Ever been to Worms? Sounds like a good old German town, doesn't it? And it is because you have Zion Lutheran Church on one side of the city and the Nightcrawler's Tavern on the other. And I like both joints. <laughs> okay, I can swing back, back and forth between those two all day long. Just okay, let's not go there. Small. So, and there are probably about 100 or 200 people in Nazareth back in Jesus' day. And so everybody knows everybody for better or for worse. You know how small town living goes, right? You can't sneeze without somebody knowing. 
So Jesus is thinking, you know, Nazareth's probably not going to work for me to launch my ministry. John the Baptist has been arrested. And Matthew says, now, when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. Galilee's the northern region. And leaving Nazareth, the small town, he went and he lived in Capernaum by the sea. Now, I don't know if you know the geography of Israel, but the Sea of Galilee is in the northern part. And about 11 o'clock a.m., you know, northwestern part of the Sea of Galilee is this town called Capernaum. And back then it's lively, it's bustling, it's hustling. There's, there's a lots of people. And this becomes Jesus' headquarters. There actually is a Capernaum, I promise you. I'm going to have the PowerPoint person take us to Capernaum. Hey, they have signs in Israel just like here too. You know, Salt Lake City, Los Angeles, Tonopah. Is that how you pronounce it? <laughs> they have them in Israel too, okay? And they got them in three different languages. They got Hebrew on the top. They got Aramaic in the middle and English in the bottom. Maybe more than that. I don't know what those other signs are, those, the, the white blocks. But yeah, there actually is a Capernaum. And let's go to the next slide. It's Jesus' hometown. Now, Capernaum was, was destroyed after a while, and they didn't even really know it was there, but some Catholic archaeologists came around in the late 1800s, and of course they discovered something. And once the Catholics discover something, I mean, they buy the land, and they put up like a monastery or, or some kind of shrine you know, to acknowledge. Well, when they undug the city of Capernaum, man, did they undig some things. Uh, this is a little monastery they were built. Let's go to the next slide. Another thing that this says, I guess that looks like it's in tile, right? You know, Capernaum, the town of Jesus. I mean, this is really cool. I mean, I'm actually in the actual town that Jesus lived in and walked in. All right, let's, next slide. This is the actual synagogue that was in the town of Capernaum. Now, you see the stone on the bottom where they're you know, kind of the black layers on the bottom? That's the original stone from when Jesus taught in that synagogue and unrolled the scroll of Isaiah and said, yeah, I've come to heal the brokenhearted, the wound, the blind, and all those kind of things. Right here in this synagogue, because a lot of times your tour guide's going to tell you, well, this is the traditional site where we think this happens. We're here in Capernaum. No, Jesus was here. This is where he read the scriptures at this place. And everything above that is, you know, new stone built over the centuries. Look at the next picture. See what it shows us. There's a, a longer stretch, a longer look at it. You can see the bottom foundation that's what scholars are saying is the original stone from the first century when Jesus lived. And then I think I have one final picture of the actual synagogue itself. How about that? Just an open court and still some of the pillars and, and monuments from the time that Jesus actually was there. Now in that same town, you have Peter's house, you know, where somebody was lowered from the roof into Peter's house. And, and Jesus healed them. So Capernaum was like a huge find. So was Mary, so was uh, the city of Magdala. You know, Mary Magdalene, that wasn't her last name, by the way. Mary was from Magdala. Iscariot wasn't Judas's last name. That's from the community where he was from. How about that? Well, Magdala was unearthed too, because when somebody goes in to build something in Israel, you know, like a hotel, not a casino, sorry, just a hotel, you know, or something else, there's a thing that they have to sign off and say, look, if you find anything interesting, like artifacts or historical things, you got to stop your digging right now because we're going to bring in our team of, of, of Israeli archaeologists just to make sure that, you know, there's nothing underneath here that's of value. Well, in Magdala, they started digging. Poof, they, they found something. They called a timeout. And sure enough, they uncovered the town where Mary was from and a synagogue and different houses. It was an incredible find. So that's a little bit about the history of Capernaum. So this is Jesus' headquarters. He's healing people. And both Isaiah and Matthew say to us, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. Now, we hear this light and darkness thing so often, guys, and it's, we're thinking, what's the big deal? Ah, you got people in the light, and you got people in darkness. We know Jesus is in the light. We know people are in darkness, and we just kind of let it go over our heads sometimes. 
But I mean, this is really huge for the Israelites and it's huge for us today because if you don't have the light of Christ living in you, you're actually living in darkness. And there's a huge difference between light and darkness. Amen? John chapter 3, you know, says it well. Now we know John 3 verse 16, right? God so loved the world, etc. But do we know the verses afterwards? Whoever believes in him, John 3, 18, is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Verse 19, light has come into the world, but men loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Verse 21, John 3, but whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. Now I gotta tell you that I think there's a lot of darkness today. There's been a lot of darkness ever since Adam and Eve bit the apple, right? There's just been a lot of evil and there's just been a lot of darkness. But now it seems like, you know, if you live in the light, if you believe in the light, if you want to be guided by the light and inspired by the light, people make fun of you. People give you a hard time. People want to censor you. People just want to shut you up because you have the light. You have faith in Jesus. And without the light, you're living in darkness. For some reason, I stumbled onto Franklin Graham, you know, this past week. And I guess it was a couple of days ago, January 20th was the March for Life. Is that right? Any of you were aware of that? Uh, I'm sure, I guess it was in DC. And uh, someone asked him from CBS News, hey, Franklin, where do you see America today? I told him, we've turned our back on God. Politicians are looking for what people want and what culture wants instead of what God wants. We need to have the absolute authority of God's word, which I like to use, say is truth. You know, that word that begins with the letter T, truth. I believe the Bible to be the word of God. What's happened as a nation is we have turned our back on God. And as a result, we are getting further and further away from him. We're not becoming a better country. We're becoming a more violent country. Our policies are failing. Our economy is failing and our country is in trouble. I think we need to take a hard look at God's laws and his standards. Now, there's a lot I agree with, frankly. I mean, there's gloom and doom, folks. There's darkness. And can I just be honest with you? It's going to get darker and darker and darker because that's what the Bible says. You know, before the second coming of Christ, you know, people are going to be turning on each other, believers against believers, non-believers against believers, mom against father, you know, son and daughter. It's going to get out of control. There's going to be more wars and more famines and everything else. It's going to get worse. So it's not all gloom and doom because if you have the light of Jesus, you have a right relationship, God, where your sins are forgiven and you're not out to lunch, I mean, like for all eternity. You're going to spend eternity with Jesus in heaven. Amen? But I know what he's talking about. In fact, he goes on to say, you know, we're kind of being persecuted because we believe in the light and want to be led by the light. And then he goes on, Franklin does, in another text, to talk about defensive men Ivan Profarov from the Philadelphia Flyers. Anybody know of this guy? Okay. Is being accused of being homophobic and hateful because he chose not to participate in a Pride Night warm-up that would have forced him to wear a Pride-themed jersey and use a Pride-themed hockey stick, you know, a rainbow-colored hockey stick at the end, that went against Christian beliefs. I've been told reporters, look, I respect everybody, and I respect everybody's choices. My choice is to stay true to myself and my religion. How about that? But being persecuted and, and forced to do something because he wants to be a light. He's not telling everybody what they have to do. You taking a knee or, or, or standing or not bowing or whatever you want to do. He's not saying you guys can't do that. He's just saying, don't force me to do that. I don't want to. I'm going to love God and I'm going to love my neighbor. It's not about me being kind or friendly or rude or angry. I'm not going to, I'm going to be kind and friendly, but don't force me to do something that goes against the light of my belief. 
You have your platform, and you can speak out if you want to, but I've got my platform too. And my platform is Jesus Christ, and my platform is the Word of God. And I'm going to stand on that platform, and you're not going to censor me. If you can speak about what you think is true and what you think is the light, then I want to speak about what I think is true and what I think is the light. Amen? And don't force me to do otherwise. You know, last week, some of you were here on Sunday, Saturday nights. Uh, I had two different sermons last weekend. The organist got to hear both because Kathy was playing. She said, Pastor B, thanks for the two sermons you gave me this past weekend. Well, which one did you like better? Well, I like the one on Sunday better. And I kind of went off on last Sunday's sermon because we're talking about truth, right? And I just said, you know, we're not going to bow down to the different platforms and agendas that people have put out there. We're not going to bow down to the idol of coexistence. We're not going to bow down to political correctness. You know, we're not going to bow down to you know, acceptance. We're only going to bow down to the platform of Jesus Christ. And we're only going to bow down to the truth. And we're not going to do anything else except stand in the light of Jesus and proclaim his good news, his salvation, his forgiveness, his mercy, and his love for people of all nations. Don't ask me to bow down to any other idol or take a knee to him because I'm not going to do it. And that goes for any political party as well. And that goes for the woke movement. That goes for BLM or any other right wing movement. It doesn't matter. I'm not bowing down to any of it. I'm just bowing down to Jesus and his platform of God's word. Amen? Amen? And then Franklin Graham goes on to praise quarterback Brock Purdy from the San Francisco 49ers. I think they're playing somebody today, aren't they? <laughs> Has been amazing in leading the 49ers. The former Iowa State QB was the very last player chosen in the draft last year. What is he, 7-0 and right now? Well, he's now definitely Mr. Relevance and stepping in after an injury to the other quarterback. He gives all the credit to the Lord Jesus Christ. Every time I play, no matter what happens, I want others to see God through my actions. Every time I step on the field, I want to bring him glory. Even when we lose, I point to God and thank him for the opportunity. Everything happens for a reason. It's a lesson from the Lord. It's a game. It's not my life. Talk about a platform. He's standing up for what he believes. And then finally, there was a guy wearing a Jesus Saves t-shirt at the Mall of America in Minnesota. Anybody been there before? The Mall of America in Minnesota? I haven't, but I've heard about it. Outside of Minneapolis, uh, security guards approached him and told him to take off the shirt or leave the mall. Because on one side it said, Jesus Saves. On the other side, it says, Jesus is the only way. And you know that coexist bumper sticker? Well, that's, you know, was on the back of a shirt and there was a line drawn through it. Okay. And we doesn't, doesn't mean we don't want to coexist and, and get along with other people and be respectful and nice and love God and love neighbor. But that doesn't mean we're going to accept and embrace and believe in and do everything that everybody else is doing. We're not. Because we're only going to follow the light, Jesus Christ. The truth is, he says, any other message on his shirt wouldn't have been deemed offensive, even if it was. Only the name of Jesus draws such opposition. The back of his shirt said, Jesus is the only way. This is the offensive truth. There's that word again, truth. That the world so desperately needs to hear. Jesus Christ saves souls from hell. And I like to wear one of my own t-shirts once in a while. You know, when I work out. It's just kind of a subtle way of, you know, putting Jesus out there in a good way. You know? And, man, this shirt cost me 40 bucks. I just want you to know, you know. <laughs> There's some CrossFit gyms out there that are, like, Christian-based gyms. And I'm okay with that. I'm glad there's Christian-based. I don't, I don't need to be a part of one. I'd rather be in an unbelieving gym, to be quite honest with you, so that I can share the, the light of Jesus in subtle ways. But I remember we had a guest visitor one time working out with us. I don't know where she was from, but somebody had blessed her with like a, 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 a kidney, donated a kidney, hers was failing. And I said, well, this is just, I'm a pastor, and this is just kind of a subtle way of, you know, getting out there. She said, I'm not so subtle, brother. Jesus has saved me, and I'm going to let as many people know as I possibly can. Because here's the truth about it, guys. There's a lot of people walking in darkness out there. Met a guy this past week from Nigeria. Had that accent. I said, man, what country are you from? Yeah, Nigeria. I said, hey, 
You know the Ogoni people in Nigeria? My first church in St. Louis back in the 90s, we helped resettle Ogonis. They were, you know, they were people of the bush and they had to leave because there was lots of strife and conflict there. And uh, I said, you a Christian? No, I'm not. What do you believe in? Well, I really don't believe in much, except I believe that, you know, all roads lead to the same God. Mm -hmm. What am I supposed to do now? Am I supposed to be quiet? Am I not supposed to speak up and say anything so that I don't hurt feelings, so that I don't offend somebody and just let them go to hell? Is that what I'm supposed to do? Or do I nicely and kindly say, you know, I believe that God created the world and that we're all messed up. And last time I checked, people are pretty broken, including myself. I'm a sinner and I need a savior. And I do believe what the Bible says, that Jesus died for my sins and he, and he rose again. And he did that for everybody. And I do believe what the Bible says, that if you believe that, your sins are forgiven and you have a place in heaven. And let the Holy Spirit do the rest. I conclude with a story, a uh, high school story. When I was a sophomore in high school, I did a, a very idiotic thing. I had two friends of mine in high school say, hey, Brad, we want you to come with us. We have found that there are actually caves underneath the city of San Antonio, and we know how to, to go there and check them out. We want you to come with us. Okay, I'll do that. You know, kind of scared. And so we go to this site, you know, kind of in the center of San Antonio. It's weird. It's almost, it's in like in an alley. And there's this big pole, kind of like a, you know, picture a silver flag pole. You know, really big. I mean, this is kind of a weird situation. You get this pole on the ground, and behind it, you just have lots of trash. It's weird. It was just kind of leaning up against this pole. And then right in front of the pole was this hole. And you had to go down into the hole, and you had like a, like a soldier get on your belly for about 10 feet you know, through this hole. And then when you, when you got to the end, you had, we all had flashlights, we could stand up. And with our flashlights, we just looked around and went, wow, this is incredible. We're actually under the city of San Antonio, man. This is a huge deal, man. Wow, this is incredible. And then I remembered, I forgot to tell my parents where I was. And then, you know, we started messing with each other, you know, turning our flashlights on and off, you know, as if they weren't working or if they were working. Because I've got to tell you, man, when those flashlights were off, I mean, it was pitch black. I mean, it was really dark. I'm serious. I put my hand in front of my face. I could not see my hand. You know that darkness. You've been there before in a place like that where you can't see a thing. I mean, you drop that flashlight on the ground and there's no light, you're, you're doing this. And if those flashlights were to go out and we needed to find that hole, you know, so that we can 10 feet back up and, and get it into the you don't have that flashlight, you're lost. What I'm trying to tell you, folks, is that a lot of people are lost. It's pitch black to them. Don't take it for granted that you know the light of Jesus and now more importantly Jesus the light knows you because a lot of people are stumbling around in darkness and they're gonna leave the darkness of this life and enter into a darkness that never ends what I'm saying is please share the light because a great light has dawned and his name is Jesus and he wants everybody to be saved, and everybody to come to a knowledge of the truth. And all God's people said,